Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries, and thank you so much for joining us. You know, the subject we've spoken about a number of times is the words of Jesus concerning the last days in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 24, and also in Mark, chapter 13, verse 8. In Matthew 24, when they asked Jesus, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? He says, you'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be frightened. Those things must take place. That is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be famines and earthquakes. Well, we should expect, as it says in Luke, pestilences. The fourth horseman of the apocalypse will ultimately have wars, pestilence, and famines concurrently as we get closer to the return of Jesus. In any event, today we're just looking at wars, rumors of wars, and nation rising against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. What does this mean as we approach the subject of prophecy? In the book of Genesis, chapter 10, we have the table of nations. All nations, ethnically and geographically, are descendant from the three sons of Noah. Shem, from where the Jewish and Arab nations emerge. Japheth, from where the Eurasians emerge, the Europeans and the Asians. And Ham, where the black Africans emerge. These three. Over a period of generations, there were interbreeding among them, obviously. We had the emergence of peoples who had both Semitic and European features, descendants of Sam, Shem, intermarrying with the descendants of Japheth and so forth. We see this in, in various countries, such as Armenia and so forth, where the people are definitely Western and European in most respects, yet, or, or certainly European, yet they have a Middle Eastern influence to their culture and so forth. We see this also in the Hamosemitic areas of Africa, where you got the descendants of Ham intermarrying with the descendants of Shem. The language Gez, the language of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, uh, their holy language for, the, for their sacred books, is in this language Gez, and it's, it's Hamosemitic. Many things like this. Malta, the language of Malta, Maltese, again, they've got the same word for bread and food as, as, as you have in Hebrew, lechem. Um, it is a mixture of the descendants of Shem and the descendants of Japheth. Uh, Malta has characteristics of Middle Eastern people and characteristics of European people resembling Italians and so forth, and Greeks, particularly Italians, yet there's this Middle Eastern influence. So then you have a mixture of these, of these nations. Anthropologists have looked at this through the prism of language, looking at common features and languages as a way to try to trace anthropological origins. Now, of course, in addition to those more traditional methods, we have methods based on mitochondrial DNA. In any event, let's understand the issue we're looking at. Nation and kingdom. The word for nation here in the Greek text of Matthew 24 and Mark 13, as we pointed out many times, is not a country. It is an ethnic identity, an ethnic or racial identity. The word is ethnon. Ethnon or ethnos in Matthew 24, ethnos. The term for kingdom is basilia, basilia. Now in Hebrew, it is goy, meaning nation, an ethnic nation, and marhut, kingdom. So you have a political term preceded by an anthropological term. This all goes back to Genesis chapter 10, the table of nations. Now, it is amazing when we look at contemporary events in the world, today's newspaper, today's news reports, go on and you'll see them talking about Iran, which is Persia, Iraq, where Babylon was, Israel, 
and so forth. The same countries that were vital in the Middle East are vital today. Arabia, Saudi Arabia is called today, once again, vital to the global economy and a feature in the geopolitical scenarios that affect the rest of the world. We see Europe, it's there, but it's specific. It's the countries in Europe that were in the southern half of the Roman Empire. Well, let's understand this. It's amazing that the books of the Old Testament primarily, which go into depth explaining what's going to happen before the return of Jesus, not only, but particularly Daniel and Isaiah, refer to these ancient nations. They don't change. Nations do not change. They may mutate, but they do not fundamentally change. People have tried to make them change, and it has always failed. Let's understand how this has worked. Karl Marx reinterpreted history as class struggle. Marxism was predicated on the beliefs of dialectic philosophy that came from Hegel. Marx said a lot of things that fundamentally were disproven by history. For instance, he followed Hegel's model of, of, of dialectic materialism. That's where it came from, from the philosopher Hegel, Hegel in 19th century German rationalism. You had the thesis, the antithesis, and the synthesis. What Marx believed was that as capitalism evolved from feudalism, so communism would evolve from capitalism. It's all based on Hegel's philosophy, which in turn is based on a Darwinistic worldview of evolution. That's what Marx said. So therefore, because Britain was the first capitalist country, that's where communism would begin. He wrote his books in London. He said it would never work in Russia. Russia was still feudal. It was the last feudal country in Europe. Yet, where did the Bolshevik Revolution take place? It took place in Russia. Marx was fundamentally wrong in the way he interpreted history. As we've ende endeavored to point out in the past, the reason he was fundamentally wrong is because the Hegelian philosophical model he based it on was wrong. And the reason Hegel's philosophy was wrong is because Darwin's science was wrong. The wrong science, a false science, led to a false philosophy, led to a false political economic theory. Something proven to be false. History fundamentally proves Marx to have been wrong. Yet we have people gravitating towards socialism, towards something that is historically demonstrated to have failed. It has not worked anywhere. I'm not singing the praises of capitalism. I'm not saying there are not abuses in capitalism and in other isms, as it were. I'm simply saying that categorically, anything predicated on the ideas of Marx have failed. There will always be a power elite. Jesus said the poor will always be with you. The only thing that the Bolsheviks wound up doing was creating a system of Sovietism, which was just the old Roman Empire reconfederated. Only instead of a czar or czar's families like the Romanovs, it had the Politburo and it had the apartheid of the Communist Party. They replaced one power elite with another. This was not supposed to happen in Marxism, but it did. Marx said, a peasant in one country and a peasant in another country have a kindred spirit because they're both peasants. It's the class struggle against the power elite that is the real struggle. It's not the struggle between poor people themselves or peasants themselves or even the proletariat themselves. Well, let's look what happened. As we know, when the Americans and Australians left Vietnam, the Chinese communists and the North Vietnamese communists had a war with each other. As soon as the Americans and Australians left, they had a war with each other. Then 
Pol Pot turned on his own people and perpetrated genocide in Kampuchea, Cambodia. Then Vietnam had a war with Cambodia. Communist against communist, yellow against yellow. It didn't matter. Communism could not change anything. It could not prevent anything. It could not bring about a unity or prevent wars or bring about egalitarianism. Those nations had always been rivals. Long before there was communism, long before there was capitalism, those nations had been rivals and rivals they remained. The Great Wall of China, I've been to it some years ago, it was built to stop Mongolian invasions of China. The Mongols have never been friends with the Chinese and either particularly have the Russians. They may make short-term alliances, but that doesn't work. I remember during the Vietnam War, Russia and China were both backing and supplying North Vietnam to fight the United States and its allies in Vietnam. During the Vietnam War, when both the Chinese communists and the Soviet communists were backing North Vietnam, they had a massive battle on the Armour River a shootout between Russia and China. Communism couldn't bring about unity or peace. Those nations had always been against each other. Even the common enemy they found in the United States did not bring about an end to the nation against nation. Nations that have always been enemies will always be enemies. And by nation, let's call it ethnic groupings, ethnos. Isaiah tells us when the Lord comes back, something will happen. Lo isa goy la goy herev, lo yilmadu od hama. Nation that is ethnic nation shall not raise sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But that's when Jesus comes in the millennium. In the meantime, the world is Satan's kingdom. It has fallen, and there can only be wars and rumors of wars. Nothing has failed more colossally and hypocritically than the United Nations. It was established to prevent any further wars after the Second World War, and there have been nearly 100 wars since the end of the Second World War, some of them killing millions of people. Unbelievable, unless you believe the word of God. Nation will be against nation. Now, I don't just mean racially. In Vietnam and in Cambodia and in China, it was yellow against yellow. An ethnic Indian and an ethnic Pakistani will often hate each other. A Hindu and a Muslim will despise each other, but their complexion looks identical. Identical. We have tribalism. And Africa. What happened with the Hutus and the Tutsis? What happened in Burundi and Rwanda? What happened with Nkata and the ANC in South Africa? These people hate each other. The genocide that's taken place in post-colonial Africa after the British and French left. What happened in Uganda under Idi Amin and the Central African Republic and these countries? What took place in Angola, Mozambique? Unspeakable human disasters worse than anything that ever happened under the Europeans. The world does not consider it politically correct to point out the fact that post-colonial Africa is bloodier and crueler to their own people than colonial Africa. And I'm not a colonialist. I'm not an imperialist. I'm simply stating the fact. Independence from European empires has not brought peace to Africa Things have become crueler. Infrastructure has broken down more. I watched Robert Mugabe rape, rape Zimbabwe and turn a wealthy country into a poor one. I've watched the ANC systematically destroy South Africa, once the most developed country with the best infrastructure in Africa. It doesn't matter. It's what Jesus said that's going to matter. In the United States, we pointed out before, 
the Lakota Indians were called Sioux by the other tribes. Sioux meant invader. They came from the Midwest and went west and conquered other Indians, other Native American tribes. The hatred that exists to this day in places like Arizona and New Mexico among Native American tribes, it's underreported, but it's absolutely there. Before the white man came, they were scalping each other in the cruelest of ways. This is not to justify what the Europeans did in mistreatment of the Native Americans, but it is to say they were far from idyllic before the Americans and Spanish conquistadors arrived. Let's look again what this is. In Ireland, Celt against Celt, Irish against Northern Irish, Catholic against Protestant. Again, it is not race. It is ethnon. In Africa, it is not race. It's black killing blacks. It's ethnon. In Yugoslavia, the powder keg of Europe, where the Roman Empire divided between the Holy Roman Empire of the Latin West and the Byzantine Empire of the Greek-speaking East. That was always a place of conflict between the Muslims, the Serbs, and the Roman Catholics. That is, the Croats, the Serbs, and the Muslims. It's always been that. Tito temporarily held it at bay with an artificial unity. Once Tito was dead and his dictatorship and communism went with him, those ethnic nations turned against each other in Bosnia-Herzegovina. What happened with the Serbs? What happened with the Croatians? What happened with the Muslims in Kosovo? Unbelievable. It doesn't matter. It's not about religion. Religion will only fuel something racial. It is not about political ideology. That may fuel something ethnic. It's not about race. That will only fuel something ethnic. It's what scripture says, nation against nation. It is ethnic conflict. Iran and Iraq, the Arabs and Persians were ancient enemies. In the jihad in the 1980s, over one and a half million Muslims were killed by other Muslims in the war between Saddam Hussein's Iraq and Iran. They massacred each other. They had a jihad against each other. Islam did not work. Islam teaches Ummah. Muslims are one nation and one people, according to the Quranic doctrine of Ummah. Well, if it was true, Iran and Iraq shouldn't have massacred each other on the scale of over a million and a half people being killed. If Marxism worked, China and Vietnam and Vietnam and Cambodia wouldn't have massacred each other on the scale they did. But communism does not work. Islam does not work. And false Christianity does not work. The Serbs and Croats, the Catholics and Greek Orthodox murdered each other. The Roman Church and the Orange Protestants murder each other. It doesn't matter. China and Japan will never be friends. Poland was always caught in between Germany and Russia. They are never going to be friends. The American Indian tribes are never going to be friends. The so-called Organization of African Unity can have all the conferences and issue all the decrees and declarations they want. They're never going to be friends. An imperial model of social, political, and economic organization was imposed on Africa by the European powers. They imposed an imperial model on a tribal civilization, a tribal culture. Once the Europeans left, those countries divided again along tribal lines. They'd always hated each other. 
In Kenya, they might have fought the Mzungu, the white people, when the Mau Mau fought the white people under Joseph Kenyatta. But now in Kenya, look at the strife between tribes. Whoever wins the election and the president of that tribe, or the, the president of the country is from that tribe, that tribe tends to benefit. The other tribes suffer detriment. It just doesn't work. Not in Ireland, not in Yugoslavia. Doesn't matter if you're white. Not in South Africa, not in Zimbabwe, not in the Central African Republic or Uganda. It doesn't matter if you're black. Not in China, not in Vietnam, not in Cambodia. It doesn't matter if you're yellow. It just doesn't matter. Nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. That's what matters. This also helps us to understand something. It helps us to understand how the books of Daniel and Isaiah can prophesy for the time we live in and the time that's coming, speaking of these ancient nations as rele relevant entities. These same countries are at the center of world events. Iraq, Iran, every day of the week, Saudi Arabia, and the conflict with Europe. Let's look at it, the Greco-Roman world. As we pointed out, the Hebrew prophet Daniel tells us, iron does not adhere to clay. You've seen little unified action from the European Union during the present coronavirus crisis. These nations are not acting as one. They're closing their borders and acting as individual nations. It doesn't matter what the Brussels bureaucracy tries to do. Now there's Brexit. It doesn't matter what the unelected Brussels socialist bureaucracy tries to implement in a non-democratic fashion, simply by a bureaucratic decision that becomes law without any parliamentary representation. It doesn't matter. It doesn't work. These nations closed their borders and enacted their own policies to protect their own citizens from being affected by citizens of other European countries, as well as non-European countries. Iron does not stick to clay. Nothing makes it happen. No false religion, no political economic system, nothing, nothing. Nation will rise against nation. As a result of the ethnic conflict, kingdom will rise against kingdom. That is the Basilea, the Marhut, the political conflicts will be born out of ethnic and tribal ones. Let's look at the United States and its history. It's been over 50 years since civil rights. I'm old enough to remember the ugliness and injustice of Jim Crow, as I've said before, going with my parents on vacation holiday to Florida, driving from New York and New Jersey through the American South. I remember white only in restaurants, and this is Klan country. I remember what that was like. I saw the ugliness of the system. Well, it's been over 50 years since the end of that, but America remains a more racially divided nation than it, country than it ever has. Additionally, black Americans, Afro-Americans, by far remain the lowest player on the socioeconomic totem pole. It doesn't matter if you elect a Barack Obama. It doesn't matter if you have a Don Lemon as a news anchor. None of that matters. The black man still stays where he always was, down. Now let's look at this. Let's look at this. The mentor of Bill Clinton, George Faber, a Southern Democrat segregationist, the mentor of Hillary Clinton, 
the late Senator Byrd, the Grand Dragon and the Ku Klux Klan. Jimmy Carter from a segregated Plains Baptist Church wouldn't allow black people in it. I remember black veterans coming back from Vietnam wanting to get a university education, a college education on the GI Bill, being banned by Democrat politicians in Alabama and Mississippi on the basis of skin color. They could not get an education after they fought for freedom in Vietnam, as they were told. This is all Democrats. Woodrow Wilson, a notorious segregationist, an enemy of the blacks, a Democrat. Margaret Sanger saw blacks as genetically inferior, and her incipient ideology permeated the thinking of the Democratic Party, which is why you have such a high abortion rate among Afro-Americans. They're simply implementing demographic control along racial lines to kill blacks in order to reduce future prison populations and welfare rolls. Now, the Civil Rights Bill was largely passed by Republicans, not by Democrats. The Democrats of the South were almost uniform in opposing it. Al Gore's father, a U.S. senator, voted against it. You look at these people, the Clintons and Carter and the Gore, the Southern Democrats, their mentors were all segregationists. They follow the ideology of Sanger. Hillary Clinton certainly does. And of course, you have the political Uncle Toms, the blacks who are used to manipulate other blacks into supporting something designed to keep the black person down as a permanent underclass, where the housing project becomes the new plantation. And just like in slavery, as I've said before, the black man is simply a stud breeding stock. Bring him in, use him to procreate more slaves, and then put them back in chains. Today, it's the same thing. Three out of four black children born out of wedlock. A black woman, very commonly in the housing projects of Baltimore or Philadelphia, will have multiple children for multiple men, and a disproportionately high percentage of those men are in prison. Children born out of wedlock don't know who their fathers are, fathers in prison, send them back. This is the policies of Jim Crow, and it's the policy today. Civil rights has not worked for the average black person, and it will not. There was at that time, in the 1960s, an anti-segregationist, half-Jewish U.S. senator named Barry Goldwater, who opposed racial segregation. He was a conservative Republican. He said, you cannot legislate brotherhood. And he opposed the Civil Rights Bill of Johnson, not because he didn't believe in civil rights, but because he said it wouldn't work. Brief history lesson. Go back to the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was personally an abolitionist. He was against slavery. But it was the 16th Amendment passed by constitutional process of the states after Lincoln was assassinated that ended slavery. The Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War was simply a political move by Abraham Lincoln to strengthen the hand of the anti-slavery British prime minister, a Jewish Christian like Goldwater, Benjamin Disraeli, to keep Britain out of the American Civil War on the side of the South. The cotton industry was being affected and wrecked havoc temporarily in the British textile trade. Major industry at that time, the fear was Britain would attack from Canada, which was still British. I've explained this before. The Emancipation Proclamation simply said, Areas of the South that were occupied by Union forces would no longer allow slavery. So you had socioeconomically displaced Afro-American slaves by the tens of thousands with nothing to do to support themselves following the Union troops. 
tens of thousands in caravans on foot following the marching Union Army, following Sherman in his march to the sea. It was simply a political move by Lincoln to keep Britain and France, particularly Britain, from coming into the Civil War on the side of the South. And it worked. Now, again, he himself was an abolitionist, but he understood that slavery would have to be abolished through moral conviction and by constitutional process. Barry Goldwater was the same. He said, the federal government cannot do the job of the states. To amend the Constitution, most of the states, a majority of the states, must vote and ratify the amendment. He said the federal government cannot do the job of the states. And he said politicians cannot do the job of preachers. You cannot legislate brotherhood. The only way to end this ugly racism and injustice of Jim Crow was by constitutional amendments, not Johnson's Civil Rights Act. And the only way to change people's attitudes on race was by moral transformation and a faith-based awakening. Well, look at it. The horrible white racism of the American South that I witnessed has been replaced by a horrible black racism. The racism against white people in the black community is unbelievable. There's no thought to the fact that the numbers of black children being conceived out of wedlock and the failing school systems of the Democratic Party and the teachers unions, which are just a uh, political campaign fund for the Democratic Party, that that's responsible for what's happening to black America. No, it's easier to blame the white establishment. I'm a white person. Even in the South, the amount of prejudice against blacks is minor compared to what it was in my youth. But the racism in the black community has grown. Racism is racism. America remains more racially divided than it ever has, and the socioeconomic status of the average black has not improved. This was admitted by the black academic Cornell Wiles from Harvard, Dr. Cornell Wiles. Left wing, I don't agree with him ideologically. I don't support his, his ideological position, which is basically socialist. I don't agree with it. But he is a leading left wing black academic and a spokesman for the Afro-American intelligentsia. He said Barack Obama's changed nothing. Tavis Smiley, the leading black American journalist, he said Barack Obama's administration was a moral failure when he spoke at Oxford University in England. It changed nothing. Even the Nation of Islam, Louis Farrakhan, who's obviously a deranged man, he's leader of the organization that assassinated Malcolm X and so forth by common report. He said Barack Obama was a community organizer. He was trying to help blacks, but as president, no, there's no legacy. The income of the average Afro-American family declined by $900 after two terms, after eight years of Barack Obama. Again, I'm not making a political speech, but the income of the average Afro-American family before the coronavirus increased by $1,000, increased by 1000 in 11 months under Donald Trump, after decreasing by nearly $1,000 after eight years of Barack Obama. It doesn't change. The status of the black doesn't change. The status of the American Indian on the reservations does not change. The ethnic hatreds between people, I don't care if it's Yugoslavia and Ireland and white people, I don't care if it's Burundi or if it's Zimbabwe, the hatred between the Mashanas and, and, and the Matabilis, the tribes, it doesn't matter if it's black, white, or yellow. Nation will be against nation. This will result in political turmoil. Now, Antichrist will come. 
and he will try to do something contrary to nature. He will seek to change the times and the laws. Let's turn to the book of Daniel. Chapter 2, please. We'll begin in verse 19. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. And it is he who changes the times and epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings, and he gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To thee, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and I give praise. Now let's understand this. The Antichrist will attempt to make the iron stick to the clay. We see the prophetic shadow of the image of the beast, the Shikusa Meshomem, after what Daniel says in chapter 3, verse 1 about the king made an image of gold, its height was 60 cubits, and it's width six cubits. Notice, in the Aramaic language, when you write it out, it comes to 666. We explain this in my book, uh, Shadows of the Beast. The Antichrist will come and demand equal time like Christ, as we've explained before, three and a half years. He will seek to change the times and the epics. He will seek to remove kings and establish kings, and these things will be given into his hand for two times a time and a half time. The only time fallen man will be able to apparently be able to reverse ethnic hatred, tribal hatred, racial hatred, is when the Antichrist, who will be Satan incarnate, at one point, virtually, attempts to make it happen. It won't work, but it will look like it, and people will believe we finally got it right. All you have to do is worship him in his image. Let's look at Daniel chapter 2, verse 32. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, and its breast, its arms of silver, its stomach, and its thighs. As the bronze in its legs, partially of iron and partially of clay. He speaks of the four world empires. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands and struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Now understand what this is saying. It is speaking sequentially from Babylon to Persia. Okay, it's doing that, going from Babylon down to Persia, and it's going then from Persia down to the Europeans. It does that. And then there's a reconfederation, reconfederation with the ten toes and so forth. Okay. There is a chronological sequence how these powers evolved, but it's the same devil on back of it. Ultimately, there will be an attempted unity of these things. These monsters will agree concurrently. He will bring about a false peace between these nations. A false peace between these nations. He will seemingly be able to recognize, reconcile the East and the West up to a point. He's going to try to counterfeit what Jesus is going to do in the millennium. Bring about global peace when the government is on his shoulder when nations shall not learn war anymore, when they will beat their, plow, they beat their swords into plowshares and pruning hooks. Antichrist will attempt to counterfeit the millennium. These four sections of the statue are both sequential, but ultimately it is attempt, an attempt by Antichrist at making them concurrent. Now, this relates to the book of Revelation and to other areas of Daniel. It's not our main subject today. But you continue looking in verse 34 until the stone was cut without hands, something that did not come from man, 
and had struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. When Western civilization is hit, when the Greco-Roman world is hit, the iron, the clay, the bronze, silver, gold are all crushed. The statue became a great mountain that filled the whole earth. No, the stone that struck the statue fills the, the whole earth. That's Jesus. That's how it's going to end. Now, the Lord told us this long ago. And we've discussed it many times in our teachings. But it's what's happening. Look at verses 42 to 45, Daniel 2. The toes of the feet were partially of iron, partially of pottery. So some of the kingdom will be strong and some will be brittle. Germany, Holland, formerly Britain, France, they were the strong countries. The Southern European countries are called virtually, they're, they're called pigs in Europe. Portugal, Italy, Greece, they're broke. This power struggle. That's in the West. In the East, it's not the Alps, it's the Himalayas. China and India have never gotten along. In Europe, it's called ultramontanism, ultramontane. The Alps with the dividing line between powerful and weak Europe, it's the same thing in Asia. There's a conflict. India is something China in the long term is very concerned about. But let's look now. We see in verse 43, in that you saw the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pot pottery. We've explained this before multiculturalism and multi-ethnicity. You can have a Hamo-Semitic, but a Semite will remain a descendant of Shem and a Hamite will remain a descendant of Ham. Interbreeding, intermarriages. I'm not against it. I'm not against Christians marrying cross-nationally or cross-ethnically believers, but it's never going to bring peace to secular nations. Intermarriage has never, ever worked. People thought it could. The royal families of Europe, the Blue Bloods, would marry other ones in order to prevent wars by making alliances. Oh, they're not going to attack us. He's my cousin. Or my wife is married to their king. You had intermarriages arranged between Spain, England, France. Marie Antoinette was not French. She was a Habsburg Austrian, you know. <laughs> The House of Hanover, the, the British royal family, they came from Germany. Catherine of Oregon, the wife of Henry VIII, was from Spain. They thought that by marrying across ethnic lines, they could bring about a peace between nations and prevent wars and also make alliances against common enemies. It's never worked. As I've said before, Kaiser Wilhelm, World War I killed more soldiers than World War II. It was only the civilian casualties that made World War II a bigger killer. Kaiser Wilhelm was the grandson of Queen Victoria of England. It, it just doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Oh, if our king marries their queen or our prince marries their princess, we can have peace. No, we can't. Nation will rise against nation. Marxism didn't change it. False religion didn't change it. Intermarriage didn't change it. Let's look. It will come about the iron and the clay. They'll combine with one another, the seed of men, but not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put to an end all the kingdoms, but it itself shall endure forever. This relates to the prophecy of the return of Jesus in Zechariah chapter 12. Inasmuch as you saw that a stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it crushed the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God 
has made known to the king what will take place in the future. So the dream is true and its interpretation is trustworthy. Its interpretation is still trustworthy. It is not political coincidence that these same nations in the book of Daniel are at the center of what is transpiring today in the world. Not at all a coincidence. Not in the least bit. Not even slightly. No, the interpretation is true. Fallen man cannot unite. The Europeans tried it with imperialism. The communists tried it with Marxism. <laughs> the blue bloods of Europe tried it with intermarriage. The Muslims and the papacy have tried it with religion. It doesn't work. It doesn't work and it never will. Nation be against nation, and as a result, kingdom will be against kingdom until that great stone, not cut with human hands, crushes and destroys Satan's political empire of Antichrist on the earth. Then there'll be a unity. Then Jew and Gentile will be one. Then. Now, of course, when the Antichrist attempts to bring about this unity, he'll be wanting to kill Christians because he will see them as obstructions to it. And then he will turn the nations against Israel and the Jews. All the other nations can be one as long as you hate the Jews, as long as you persecute the Christians. This is what happens. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Nobody, nobody has ever persecuted the Jews and persecuted the true church and not come under the judgment of God. Nobody, no empire, no leader, nobody. It may be happening as we speak to Kim Jong-un in North Korea. He arrests people for being Christians. He arrests their children and their grandchildren. Three generations of people are put into communist prison camps because one of their grandparents is a Christian. If that man is as sick as they say, <laughs> hell is waiting for him. I remember the judgment on Nikolai Ceausescu, a man who persecuted Christians terribly. When you read Richard Wormbrand's book, uh, Tortured for Christ, what happened to Ceausescu? <laughs> what happened to Stalin? Be not surprised when sudden destruction comes upon the wicked. What happened to Hitler? He died cursing the Jews, only to stand in judgment before the God of the Jews, before a Jesus Christ who was a Jew. The interpretation is true. Scriptures are right. Daniel was correct. Isaiah was correct. Zechariah was correct. And above all, Jesus was correct. Ethnon against ethnos. Basileon against Basileon. Goy against Goy. Marhut against Marhut. But a day is coming. Lo isa Goy, lo Goy herev. Lo yilmadu od milhama. Nation shall not lift sword against nation, and neither shall they any longer learn war. Thank you so much for listening. Please visit our website, morial.org. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless you and your family. And tell somebody about Jesus and his salvation. Thank you. <laughs>